So, part one, separate spheres towards a female identity. Dete depend upon it, Lucretia, that woman can never be developed in her present drapery. She is a slave to her rags. Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote this to Lucretia Mott on October 22, 1852. In the mid-19th century, Stanton was cultivating the language of slavery to explain the plight of women in the United States. By 1859, this analogy was commonplace in the progressive movement, but it was also a strong point of division. At the Friends of Human Progress meeting in July of that year, Dr. O. A. Wellington, who was male, pointedly noted that, quote, the slavery of woman is greater than African slavery. Stanton must have been proud. Her desire to have the suffrage of women ranked as a higher priority than abolition was well known among those who worked tirelessly in the name of 19th century liberal causes, primary upon which were female suffrage and abolition. The idea that white, upper-class women were to be forced into further subjugation as reams of uneducated black men from the South lined up at the polls was a source of strangulating fear and gall among women. At this same meeting, however, Lucy N. Coleman, clearly a female, showed the animosity and divisiveness within the political movement of progressivism. She passionately queried, is there, quote, a wife present that would change her place with the slaves on the plantation? If so, let her stand up, that I may look upon her. Is there no difference in being a slave of one man or the lust of a thousand men? I am sensitive on this women's rights question. I know that she suffers. I know how hard it is to be shut out from all lucrative employment. But I know that my master cannot sell my children for lust. Dr. Wellington, in turn, replied, quote, The enslavement of woman most affected the human family for the reason that she is mother to us all. We all, white and black, receive at our birth the effect of our mother's enslavement. Upping the ante, Wellington's retort now places the onus of slavery onto every male, as all humans must be born of a mother. This exchange reveals a maelstrom of rhetoric outlining the content contentious and vehement debate taking place in the United States at the time. For women, this meant an impassioned plea for place and space in the fabric of the new republic. Lucy Coleman rightly and righteously notes that no white woman, particularly the wealthy women who had the leisure to attend Friends of Human Progress meetings could or would trade place with female slaves, women who were legally subjected to rape, whose children could legally be sold away from them, and were non-citizen property. Her own use of the phrase, no wife here, is illustrative, for it was as wives that these women were given status and voice. Women had no right to speak or act as individuals. Dr. Wellington's passion, passionate argument centered around the idea that women must be revered as mothers. He invoked the consummate ideology of Republican motherhood frequently found behind the mainstream discussions of women's empowerment in the nascent nation state. The language of women, motherhood, suffering, and bodily rights were inextricably tied together. The above exchange during the Friends of Human Progress meeting struggled with questions of agency and prioritization. While common ground existed, both abolition and female suffrage were seen as questions of decency and moral corruption. The lines were drawn. How dare women compare themselves to men of darker complexion who were in literal chains? How dare uneducated men of color suddenly have the possibility of leapfrogging over women who had patiently been working within the system to find empowerment? to have political voice, to have economic opportunity. However, by borrowing each other's language, ultimately both sides weakened themselves. Throughout the 19th century, pre women frequently espoused a theory of separate spheres, wherein women's <coughs> source of power lay in her quiet domestic arena, from which she could educate her children and gently sway her husband towards morally correct positions, which would in turn be reflected in political votes around social and economic issues. Whether conservative or liberal, women consoled themselves that their voice was heard in the home and transmitted into the outer world of trade, commerce, and politics. The self-ascribed sphere theory 
was found in the writings of both emerging feminists. For example, Margaret Fuller's essay, Woman in the 19th Century, was published, published posthumously in 1855 with the subtitle, Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Woman. And harbingers of the patriarchy, such as William Andrews Alcott, who Dr. Spock of the 19th century lobbied men to, quote, render woman in the sphere in which she moves properly understood and appreciated, especially by herself. Within separate spheres, female influence was seen as infinite and a significant aspect to the success of the new democracy, already known for its low rates of illiteracy and a strong sense of piety. Thus, separate from the commercial world, women's role was seen or hoped to be of equal significance as they were the custodians of education, moral, religious, and academic, including music, for both young men and women. Part two, slavery and abolition. History proves, however, that the primary issue of the 19th century was slavery. From the very beginning of the country's new status of independence, people were struggling with ideas of equality. As early as 1787, Prince Hall, a Revolutionary War hero and African American, called for equitable schools for black children in Boston, noting, quote, we have the right to enjoy the privileges of free men, but that we do not will appear in many instances. One out of many is the education of our children, which now receive no benefit from the free schools in the town of Boston, end quote. In the early years of the New Republic, free black men expected equality. Increasing slave trade and lack of both political and legal support moved equality farther and farther away. As the century turned, calls for everything from abolition to colonization for the purpose of relocating free black people became common the language used became increasingly bitter. By 1862, Abraham Lincoln openly admitted in a meeting with free colored men, quote, there is an unwillingness on the part of our people, harsh as it may be, for you free colored people to remain among us, end quote. Advocating for government-sponsored colonization projects, Lincoln justified his stance as a political pathway to peace and was following the advice of such practiced diplomats as Henry Clay. Scholar Nicholas Guillot argues that this concept of colonization was a liberal-backed version of separate but equal, in other words, the roots of segregation, citing both Clay and Lincoln as part of his argument. It was not until 1896 that the language of segregation was intentionally and legally indicated in Plessy v. Ferguson's upholding of the laws of separation common in the South. The term, separate, appears nowhere in the Supreme Court decision. It was, however, common parlance throughout the 19th century, and is frequently found in the rhetoric of both antebellum sphere theory and postbellum Jim Crow laws. The actual roots of the term Plessy versus Ferguson are found in the 1890 Louisiana Separate Car Act, in which there was a required separate colored and light railway car. The lines pro and con for abolition were deeply sown in the language and imagery of Jim Crow, a T.D. Rice character from the early American blackface minstrel stage. Interestingly, the beginnings of minstrelsy can be traced to around the same time as colonization movements. The image of Jim Crow created this shamefully durable stereotype of the uneducated and incapable black male. It also strongly reinforced the idea that Quote, toward all common people, black and white, there is patronization at best and disgust at worst. End quote. Circling the context directly back to Elizabeth Cady Stanton and the desire to liberate educated white women, either before or simultaneous, with black men. In 1860, Stanton created a cure. This time, at, perhaps shockingly, the May 8, 1860 meeting of the American Anti-Slavery Society when she proposed a resolution where, quote, while our first care is the emancipation of the southern slave, we women are at the same time working in our own salvation, end quote. The idea that education, so much a part of separate spheres, was inherent to political voice, soon blended into southern segregation and the eventual creation of the so-called Jim Crow laws, indicating laws of segregation designed to marginalize 
and minimize African American agency and influence by decreasing educational employment opportunities at the same time increasing social anxiety and mobility. The negative impact of Jim Crow, the term and the caricature, which we're going to talk about more in a minute, can easily be found in civil rights sites and histories. The character had his beginnings in minstrel theater as a dance and as a piece of sheet music, and all indications are that minstrel shows were considered slumming it for a carousing audience of white men. Upper class white women, while certainly aware, were not typically attending these minstrel shows. How then does a philosophy of separate power spheres designed often by and for upper to middle class white women eventually become mirrored into a separate but equal philosophy that became institutionalized as segregation and racial inequality? Why did supposed progressive women, so continuously aware of the inequity of the above philosophy, support the same idea when it was applied racially? To understand the complexity of ideology, one must look beyond the rhetoric of politics into cultural identity. Sheet music of the time reflects and cements any number of cultural ideologies, including sentimentality, Christian piety, death and loss, love, both familial and romantic, alongside equality, regionality, classism, and racism. Scholarship on such popular genres including minstrelsy, English language opera, and plantation songs, as seen through the work of Dale Cockrell, Catherine Preston, and William Austin, make it clear that classism is actually central to any understanding of 19th century American culture. Indicators include that, as Preston notes, while English language opera abounded, it was only Italian opera that was raved about in the press. Cockrell found that understanding the complexities of minstrelsy takes place often by looking at court cases and police files instead of archived special collections. And Austin reveals that Stephen Foster, the darling of the canon of American music, fought long and hard against his background in minstrel music to be accepted as a quote-unquote valid musician. Understanding the culture and realm of women in 19th century America, meanwhile, relies on family letters, diaries, printed ephemera, and the personal bound collections of sheet music work that I most recently So, part three, the sheet music. Purveyors of sheet music were clearly aware of gender and racial biases. Sampling sheet music covers solidifies the language and images found during the antebellum and postbellum at the same time that ideas around separation were becoming ingrained. This lithograph is one of the most overt and revealing images about appropriate white masculinity and music. When shown this cover in classes, students regularly comment on the size of the piano, the grand recognition of Steinway, the obvious reference to Beethoven on the music stand, by the way, nothing in the collection is Beethoven. It's all <laughs> The grandiosity of the space, including a classical artwork in the alcove. Um, with a Grecian lyre, or lyre, and the formality of the dress of the presumed Kunkel brothers. While the lithograph is from 1875, all of these aspects point to well-indoctrinated tropes about serious music and who it's being marketed to in the 19th century and today. Germanic solo piano, read serious, repertory is designated for men of prestige and ability. Harkening back to a classical understanding, as in a Greek, understanding of the music of spheres emphasizes what emphasizes what is already dominating about the image. Music, good and proper music, can influence beyond the home into society at large when presented in a serious and solemn manner, which in turn is a small step towards justification of music at home, a women's fear and education. Standard sheets found in women's domestic volumes range from the simple to the ornate and rarely deviate from lithographs upholding the standard tropes of 19th century sentimentality. This routinely includes images of a boat with a courting couple, replete with a romanticized ideal in the background, requisite castle usually included, a gravestone for a dearly departed, a fetishized depiction of a young girl at the piano, clearly placed within the domestic arena. The Kiss Waltz from 1868 incorporates many such tropes. 
there is the classical imagery, you know, the Parthenon-like gazebo on the hillside, um, the patriotic array of instruments at the bottom, the expected Grecian lyre now sits atop a variety of strings, spikes, and drums all surrounding the stars and stripes. Add in the iconography of Republican motherhood, in which patriotism, literacy, and etiquette were the three legs of stability within separate spheres, and the marketability of the piece is heightened. The young girl and boy, who are on this side, um, her shorter skirts denote her age as a student, stand appropriately side by side, singing from one music sheet on the bottom left corner, and an interior courtship ritual or lesson, which is here, um, interior courtship ritual or lesson at the piano with the square, which means a domestic piano, that her hair is cut up to depict both her age and proper etiquette, and there is a hidden male. At least we presume that he's male because there doesn't appear to be two buns or two sets of skirts. Squarely places this work within the domestic arena. Humorously, the owner of the sheet had a tongue-in-cheek inscription at the top which says, My favorite waltz, no one. <laughs> Whether this is her commentary on music itself or a later edition, by the way, this is a four variation set on a very, very, very simple waltz. Um, so whether her contemporary, her commentaries on the music or not, the piece was deliberately included in her bound volume and provides telltale clues about musical expectations. Now to the hard stuff. While such domestic music is often multivalent and subtle, music about African American life, or rather the depiction, the white depiction of black men is offensively clear. While the Jim Crow character was created by T.B. Rice, who was engaged in cutting social and political satire, <coughs> the all too prevalent image took on a life of its own throughout the century. Here, the caricature features of the black man, the prominent forehead and chin, the ratty and tattered clothes, um, patchwork pants and whole shoes, the gesture-like angularity of the pose all point to a man who is comically and tragically incapable of thought beyond bodily agency. The Rabelaisian aspect of the actual music and lyrics of the piece are rarely focused on today, nor were they during the 19th century. The fact that Jim Crow as a piece of music was bound into what Dale Cockrell calls, quote, the spirit of the burlesque, political action, parlari, and carnival from the outset, end quote, may explain why it held agency within both the black and white social realms, but it also complicates the history of the image. Other pieces, such as this version of O Susanna by Christie's Minstrels, make clear the white connection to black-based minstrelsy. Often this was done to promote the music. Marketing minstrel music is somehow acceptable beyond low-class theater and demarking the troops and composers as educated, serious musicians. Here the very white Edwin Christie is shown at the top with vignettes from the minstrel, so he's white, and then all of these are blacked up things that would have been shown or seen during the actual show. Um, with vignettes from the minstrel show underneath, including the ever-present minstrel line at the bottom. Significantly, this cover is not from a bound domestic volume of sheet music. Such images are almost never found within domestic collections, denoting in and of itself the fact that minstrelsy was not seen as acceptable middle class or upper class entertainment for females, and the difficulty such images represented for both bridging the class gap for the performers and the consumer. This music was well known. It was often referred to in street parlance, but it was not to be performed in the parlor. The rare times that menstrual music does appear in the white female world, surmised by its inclusion in such volumes, is almost always muted. In this version of the Christie tunes, the differences are distinct. The piece is marketed as Ale Americain, with the quasi-French expression. It is an arrangement by Henri Ertz, who was a respectable composer. This is for solo piano, therefore it, re it includes no dialect or lyrics of any kind. A few nods to minstrelsy exist in the, in the incest. At the bottom, 
we have a male in top hat, which is formal wear, who is clearly blacked out, and a younger boy who appear in a boat. This is a pretty standard trope in sheet music. The female dancer, however, in the upper left corner, while she appears to be African American, she has anglicized features and incorporates a ballet stance, emphasizing a European tradition of highbrow art. Adjacent to her, however, is a black faced cherub. More prevalent in the domestic arena was Stephen Foster, who bridged the gap into accessibility in large part due to his progressive humanitarian depiction of the black slave. His work, Old Uncle Ned, ends with the following stanza. When old Ned Damasa, when old Ned died, the master take it mighty hard. The tears run down like the rain. Old Mrs. turned pale, and she get very sad, because she never see old Ned again. While the song's lyrics include the incredibly offensive N-word repeated several times earlier in earlier stanzas and are difficult for modern readers due to offensive dialect. Understanding that in the 19th century, she, such text was seen as humanizing and progressive in intent is, successive, is, is significant. The impact of Foster as both musician and pivotal figure in the fight for equality was such that his hometown of Pittsburgh erected this statue to him. The difficulties this statue represent in the modern era are obvious and layered. Ned is depicted lying at the feet of Foster in a subjugated position. Um, the statue was taken down. There was uh, several editorials in the Pittsburgh Gazette about whether or not it should be. And interestingly, Dean Root, who is, was the primary Foster scholar, um, and just a little bit of an aside, uh, really advocated for it to be kept up, but to be more educational. Um, so both gratefully and sadly, his wife is a writer in Pittsburgh, and they were standing right outside the center of the So, um, I think the whole image of hatred is very difficult and well-known in Pittsburgh, but this is one piece that was um, taken down. And I'm not entirely certain where I remember where it was put, but I think it's now in the museum. So, the lyrics leading to this image were viewed as progressive, which is difficult for modern listeners to perceive and reiterate the contradictory and antagonistic aspects of the abolitionist and suffragette causes. A final progressive piece, Henry Clay's Grand March, Waltz, and Quickstep. I've mentioned Henry Clay a couple of times. Henry Clay was um, an ambassador to Russia. He was a, a representative from Kentucky. And throughout most of the early century in the United States, in the 19th century, he was um, considered to be exceedingly influential. His daughter, Laura Clay, um, who I wrote about before, uh, was the first woman to ever run for vice president. Um, so, Henry Clay's Grand March, Waltz, and Quickstep has been looked at in depth by Candace Bailey and brings the discussion full circle. Clay's progressive politics included colonization in support of the rights of African Americans, at, later on, abolition, as well as economic protectionism and added support of the merchant class. Bailey notes the contradictions on this lithograph which she found in the collection of Mary Stedman, whom she describes as, quote, a lady of quality, but not of wealth. The mere fact that Stedman owned this piece suggests progressive leaning. So in other words, it doesn't have lyrics, but the mere fact that she included it suggests that she is progressive. At the same time, Bailey writes that the image, quote, sends mixed messages. The scantily clad women who served as somewhat classical statues lending tradition to Clay's political efforts vividly contrast with the demure and modestly dressed young woman who is reading in front of the landscape. So in other words, here we have these sort of partially clad women, but then we have this very domestic scene at the bottom, and there's a pretty, um, oh, this one out. There's a pretty grandiose mansion behind her. So um, I don't know the idea is that she's standing in front of a, or sitting in front of a painting or a window. Um, so the statues lend tradition to Clay's political efforts and vividly contrast with the demure and modestly dressed young woman who's reading in front of the landscape. It shows what appears to be a home, signifying that the woman's place was indeed at home. Bailey continues, quote, the proper young woman also might have served to sell the music to conservative buyers, just as the draped nymphs might have attracted other 
types of consumers. Thus, the image skirts the idea of propriety just enough to be attractive and acceptable in the progressive hunt. Tangling of messages abounds in the lithography of 19th century sheet music. However, coding and lines of propriety were clear. White and black rarely mix. White women are appropriately attired and most often appear in the home. While there were pieces composed specifically addressing the progressive platform, they were not common outside of the performance hall. Abolitionist songs including Right Over Wrong and Topsy Song were more prevalent. However, the popularity of minstrelsy and its use in mainstream imagery more than offset any inroads made in popular culture by abolitionist songs. Women's rights songs included Kate Horn's Woman's Right, a right ballad rightly illustrating women's rights, which is actually a satire of the whole movement. And Fanny Fern's Woman's Rights, which can be read as either progressive or conservative. Women may have felt stifled, but music most frequently reiterated the restrictions on their place and station. Stanton's frustration about women's singular path must be conceded, even as her analogy to slavery represented a leap most Americans were very uncomfortable taking. It's then a conundrum that the same language used to subjugate women, separate but equal, became the language of, Af of an American-based segregation and apartheid. At its core, the very desire for separation suggests systemic, inherent, and seemingly insurmountable inequality. Things are separated when something is perceived to be dangerous or preferable for ourselves than what another person has. At its core, ideas of class and propriety out-influence out American opinions of race, so much so that the terminology bled into all areas of subjugation and the coding of popular culture upheld the dominant concepts of culture politics. I wonder if you're familiar with Christopher Page's work on women and the guitar in Romantic Hymns, and the way he uses engravings. It yes. seemed to resonate with a lot of what he showed. I really like his ideas around the musicking, right? Mm -hmm. So music is a, is a verb beyond it just being playing, right? So that, and I think I've been really influenced by his concepts of how um, music is this cultural um, entity that we must look to. Um, you know, I think that we like to focus on how music is used to advance social causes, but what I keep running into is how music so often upholds things in the mainstream. And so it became interesting to me because after several years of looking at in classes the Jim Crow imagery and then last year looking at the Stephen Foster statue and having students read about that and having discussions in class and, and thinking about the fact that this word separate was so incredibly common in the 19th century, and it makes no sense that both the progressive movement was using it and, 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 and was being upset by it, right, on one side, and yet then was using it for their own purposes if it helped them subjugate by race. And so it became very, very clear to me that class is really at the core. Um, because the women who are upset are all upper. Excuse me, they're of course the same women who can afford to buy sheet music because sheet music costs a lot. I think the last calculator I looked at said so one piece of sheet music would translate roughly to $10 to $15. And that's not, you know, a book. That's not, you know, Mozart's arias. That's one song. Well, I noticed just in your examples that the Waltz for the Woman is, you know, the dime series, and then the other page is all 80 cents a dollar. 
you know, so like all the series seems to seem to cost six times as much. And you notice that right, these images are multi they they they're mm -hmm. used over and over again. So that image um, of the Christie's minstrels, that's all the Christie's works, right? It's both Susanna, it's many, many, many pieces. Um, so they just use the same cover because then you don't have to set the typeface a hundred times, right? You just get the image. And you use the same cover for different publishers as well, right? Because publishers tend to be local and regional. So if you see like a New York publisher, you'll see underneath also a Boston publisher, also a Pittsburgh publisher. Um, in the South, you'll see a New Orleans publisher and a Louisville publisher. But this is different from price. Also, it's, it's, it's a quite a market that is one clearly meant for consumption. Right. Uh, you know, the designers get it out, done the next. Mm -hmm. of course, the are you familiar with the term I think it's called forget me nots that were a style of music that was pervasive around the time of the menstrual songs and things that were also termed I think false spirituals yeah I'm familiar with false spirituals I'm not as familiar with forget me nots I think that's the term. It was a. It was a. If that's the, not the correct term. It was a style of music that was very uh, nostalgic of the old South after the Civil War, and folks, things like "I wish I was in a land of cotton." Old times there are not forgotten because they were uh, hearkening back to the time when the South reigned and were melancholy about that not being the case anymore. And so a lot of songs were written hearkening back to that and they speak to some of the things you were mentioning in your presentation about um, like when you mentioned the old Ned song of uh, Stephen Foster and uh, we wish we could go back where the folks were on the plantations and very happy. Oh, oh yeah, right, because everybody was so happy. Of course, yes. Right. So one of the things that um, uh, I, was, I, I showed a part of my paper to a thesis student the other day to try to explain to him what footnotes, how footnotes could be used. He's like, half the page is footnotes. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, because one of the things I didn't talk about in the body of the paper is that one of the criticisms of Nicolas Guillot, who says that this whole suburb of equal was actually um, a liberal backed idea, is incredibly um, controversial in, in mainstream histor historians. And one of the reasons that he's so controversial is that he is saying that this concept of colonization was parallel to the Trail of Tears and to the removal of Native Americans from Native American land. And he says, well, what we're forgetting here, or what the critics of Nicholas Kia are saying is, what we're forgetting here is that it was really easy to say, let's pick up the Native Americans and move them out because they weren't part of an indoctrinated um, economic system, which the Africans, African Americans were de definitely part of the economic system in the South, and they're what caused it to be economically viable, right? You have to suddenly pay all of what is your slave labor, and then your economic viability goes down, and no one was using Native Americans for this kind of work ethic, right? For this kind of work. So that's um, something that I think is a really um, significant part of this is that there is the whole um, economic Marxian way of looking at all of this work as well. One other point in connection with that, something I want to do some research on. One of the composers that came up in some of my research in preparing for a course was that one of the prolific composers of these old spirituals and forget me nots was an African American. Um, who was somewhat, uh, I think he was in Philadelphia, um, and was somewhat successful, but he was writing these songs, and was, you know, developing a career, which I just found very fascinating, because it seems almost self-defeating, or uh, an instance of self-hatred, or one trying to, um, or struggling with their own social location in the midst of all of this. Well, Candace Bailey has looked at, I don't know if she's published it yet, she did a paper at a panel that I was on um, maybe a year or two ago, and she's looked at several New Orleans volumes that have, um, that were owned by African American or Creole women, who were very definitely, right, upper class, right. black, free women, mm -hmm. um, and all the same tropes show up over and over again. So yeah, there's definitely this aspect of that there's a tangling between free 
black culture, enslaved culture, and there was definitely a class divide. And I go back to this concept that every time I turn around, I end back at classism, right? So that it's uh, definitely a, we are, everyone is trying to jump over each other to be better than the other person in some way, shape, or form. I think um, one of the things I've thought about quite frequently as I wrote this paper was the historical adage that if you want to understand the time you're living in now, read the historians who are writing now, because they're most likely talking about their own time. I don't want to say anything more than that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you could fill me in just so I don't know the history. So how does this discussion about uh, abolition and suffrage, how does it change you know, post-emancipation? Because there's still, what, there's like 50 years between Well, I think what I'm saying is that it doesn't really change. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't really change. And what happens is it becomes institutionalized in Plessy versus Burton. The reason that we have the actual song Jim Crow is actually a dance, it's not a song, although there are lyrics to it. Um, it's the super fast pace. The reason that the image is actually um, sort of gesture like and sort of leaping is because it's a dance where you jump Jim Crow. Um, that's the end of the line. Always, well, it's um, I think that uh, Dale Cockrell writes that it's something like 26 stanzas long, and it, there were stanzas that got added every year because it was a political song. And so it depended upon who was running for what. And it was it was usually quite um, progressive for who they were trying to support. But the image was, the image completely eclipsed the work, uh, the, the music. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. There's cookies.